What's up, y'all? I'm Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut. Welcome to Episode 8 of Lawns Across America. Hey, so welcome back, everyone. Today is actually, as I'm recording this, is official first day of spring, March 20th, 2019. And I can tell you that just from the buzz I'm hearing in the community, from the emails that I'm getting, and from what I'm seeing in the group and the Facebook group and things, a lot of you all are finally getting out the further north you are. You're finally getting out to see your lawn or at least pieces or parts of your lawn for the first time after winter. You got this warm spell across a lot of the country and a lot of y'all are getting out. I know that feeling. I know how that is. And you're getting out and it's you're asking questions. You're seeing things. You're going on YouTube and you're searching and you're coming into the community. And it's just been great to see more and more of you coming back in, getting excited. And then a lot of y'all that are kind of newer to the community, maybe you're some newer homeowners that you haven't really had to search for lawn care information in the past, but now you just bought a home over the winter and you're seeing your lawn for the first time and now it's time for you to get out and start asking some questions. So you're coming into YouTube and you're looking and you're finding the community and getting involved. So I'd like to welcome you all here too. And then there's this other section of our community. I think you all are what I will call aspirers, um, meaning you have aspiration to one day do your lawn. I think a lot of you may live in apartments right now. You're DIY minded. I remember when I lived in my first apartment in Crown Point, Indiana, folks that are from the region will know it's called Pine Island Apartments. I don't know if it's called that anymore. And um, fun place, uh, very interesting place, but I had an apartment in there. I went to college pretty much almost right across the street from there. And uh, so it was almost like married people's dorms for our college, kind of kind of crazy. But I was such a DIY-minded person, I wanted to do projects. And I remember one time they had this old, nasty, one-by-one tile on the floors in the bathroom, and I didn't like it. So I went and bought some self-leveling cement again, not, not, there was no YouTube back then. So it was really all you could find on HGTV. So I went and I bought some self-leveling cement and put it down thinking it would fill the gaps or the, yeah, the gaps in the tile. And, uh, and so I put that down and then I put linoleum squares, 12 by 12 linoleum squares on top of that. And the idea was to convert a tile floor to a linoleum floor. And needless to say, that failed. The self-leveling cement underneath all cracked. The linoleum came up, but I had moved out by that time, and they did send me back my security deposit, so I guess I was okay. But I wonder how many of you have done that. You've lived in an apartment somewhere, and you have just tried to DIY something, and you kind of look back on it. And I, I've got some other things I try to do, drilling into the outside of that place and doing all kinds of things. But So if you live in Pine Island and your apartment leaks in Building C, I'm sorry. <laughs> or if you have nasty floors... But I think there's a lot of you out there, though, that maybe you one day will aspire to buy a house and you know you're going to have a lawn. And so when you're there, you want to be ready. And I love that. I also think there's some of you that actually own a house right now and you have a professional service that's treating that that house. But you're here because you want to learn more about what that service is doing. You want to understand more about what your true green guy is putting down and why. And you want to find out how you can maximize what that true green guy is doing. And I think that both of you are in kind of a similar group. You're not necessarily doing your own lawn right now, but you're learning about it. You're studying. You're getting knowledge, and that's that's important. I I often say that back going back to my days when I used to watch HGTV or DIY Network, and again, there wasn't really a YouTube back when I was coming up in my 20s, and so that was all we would have, and I loved to watch kitchen remodeling shows. That was one of my favorite things, and I would watch I would watch the same ones over and over. And back then I would watch Bob Vila, This Old House. He was kind of the original DIYer from my estimation. And I would do that. And I would always aspire to remodel a kitchen one day. I thought, wow, this is gonna be great someday if I can remodel a kitchen. Well now, 20 something years later, I'm in my going into my late 40s and I still have never remodeled a kitchen. However, if I ever do have to get hire someone to remodel a kitchen for me. I will have knowledge about the steps, maybe the order that it happens in. I understand tiling. I've done a lot of tiling and other things, but what I'm saying is I understand enough that I can be an educated homeowner so that when I get a contractor in here, I can speak to them in an educated manner and understand you know, different things. Um, so that's one of the things I'm talking about, that some of you are just here to get that type of education so that you are just a more educated consumer for something you're paying for. And I think that that's pretty interesting because I've had a few questions come in this week that are around that. And so here's one right here, and this is kind of the first question that we're going to go to. 
and this is from a guy named Matt H, and he's in Atlanta. He says, hey, Alan, I'm in the Atlanta area. I planted Zeon Zoysia last year, and I have a lawn service that has been treating the lawn every month. Is that excessive for zoysia grass? So this is a guy here. I'm just going to use True Green Chem Lawn as our example because that's just a lawn service to me, okay? That's what they are. And so I'm going to assume that he's got, he's saying he has a lawn service and he's asking, hey, they're treating the lawn every month. Is that too much? And so my response to him, and this was in an email, but my response was, hey, that's really hard for me to judge because if they're applying high doses, you know, one pound per thousand, one pound of nitrogen per thousand fertilizer every single month, all during the growing season, and they're also hammering you with blanket applications of weed control, and they're also hammering in fungus, if they're hammering all those things in there every single month, and I'm using an extreme here to illustrate a point, then yes, that would be excessive. But maybe they're not. Maybe your lawn service is not a true green. Maybe it's someone else that maybe uses like Green County type fertilizer products, and maybe that every month treatment is some humic acid. Maybe it's some sea kelp. Maybe it's some other biostimulants for the soil here and there. Maybe it's only spot sprays for weeds, as little as possible. Maybe some some good pre-emergent strategy. Maybe it's a low nitrogen, higher uh, micronutrient product. I don't know, right? So to ask me if they're treating every month, is that good or bad for your zoysia? I don't know. And that's why I'm glad you're here though, Matt, because if you read what they leave you, here's the thing about your professional lawn service. They will leave you a ticket or a receipt for everything they did. And by law, in most states, in fact, as far as I know, in every state, a licensed applicator or a company that is doing applications of pesticides for hire, they're required to leave a ticket with you that lets you know what was applied, how much was applied, the rates, the time, they even have to put in, in Illinois, where I worked in Indiana, you had to put the wind speed, the wind direction, all of these things had to be highly calculated. That's why being a professional lawn applicator, it's you're literally a chemist and you're a weatherman, you're a lot of things all in one, and you have to be that during different hours of the day. Uh, to know what you're applying, what you can, what the temperature is. We talk about a lot of products that say don't apply over 85 degrees. Well, a professional that's out on the road knows that he has to make certain applications to certain houses earlier in the morning before he hits 85 so he can control certain problems. He's, he's literally, that is a very difficult job when you look at it that way. For us, we as homeowners only have to treat one single lawn. And in this case, you have the professional treating your lawn. So if you learn the things that I teach you about nitrogen rates and what that means and dialing your fertilizer up and down and how to spray weed control and, and even they'll put active ingredients on the receipt and you can go and you can Google those active ingredients and find out what they're targeting and why. And I can tell you that if you called back to True Green, even True Green, and you said, hey, I'm really studying what you guys put down. I'm not calling to ask for any, a negative thing here. I'm calling because I see everything you did and what I wanna do is maximize those results. Can I talk to a field manager? I guarantee you the True Green, for, well, when the True Green customer service rep gets up from falling out of her chair that she got that good of a question, she will get you with a service, he or she will get you with a customer service or with a service manager and they will help you. I promise you they will because they want you to be an educated customer. So if they applied a pre-emergent today, they would talk to you about it and go, yeah, I'm really glad you called. Today was a pre-emergent. You can see on your ticket there, we left you prodiamine. We applied prodiamine. Now we need you to get out and water that in. And you'll know, yeah, that's right. I studied prodiamine on YouTube on the Lawn Care Nuts podcast. I'm good with that. I understand what they did and I understand why they did it and what the expectation is. The other thing you can learn to do by being one of these aspirers who is just now in our community and learning and understanding, is you'll learn better mowing practices. Like I talk about mowing twice a week, mow on Wednesdays for weeknight lawn work, and then enjoy your Saturday or Sunday mow. If you ask a professional right now, what is the one thing, if you ask a professional, there's one thing that we could have all of your customers do perfectly this year. What's the one thing, Mr. Lawn Care Professional, that you would want your customers to do? Every one of them would say, I want them to mow the lawn properly. I guarantee you, watering irrigation is important, but if you're willing to let your lawn, your cool season lawn go dormant in the summer, then it's not a problem if you just know that that's what's gonna happen. But mowing has to be done properly because if you let the lawn overgrow and you break the one third rule, which is never cut off more than one third of the grass blades length in a single mowing, if you start breaking that over and over and over, you're literally breaking down the lawn. It's like taking a baseball bat to the knees of your lawn every week if it gets overgrown too often. And then does it matter what your professional services treating your lawn with, it's not going to work as well because you're literally beating the knees of your grass every week. So that is important. So you would end up becoming a much better customer. Now, 
another question that I get very often is, what if I want to, to be one of these folks that, hey, I got True Green out here, they're doing some stuff, but I want to I wanna learn a little bit of my own. I want to do some spraying and praying too. What can I come in with? And the answer is, that's where RGS and the biostimulants come in. Now, if you have a company that is what I would call more funky fresh, you know, and they're into the humic acid and the sea kelp and some of these types of things, biologicals, then no, you don't, this is not your, your deal here, but that those types of companies are not as common as the true greens of the world, which are just out there spraying fertilizer and weed control, which is fine. They fit a, a role and that's what those companies do. So if you have one of those companies like a true green and you want to start learning to spray a little bit, you want to learn or implement some of the things that you've been learning here, that's where the biostimulant pack can come in. Because listen, that's humic acid, it's sea kelp. There's some micros in the micro green. The aerate would be awesome. Definitely a good product because it's going to go down there and break bonds and just create that's what how aerate works it's it's strong enough of a product and i'm not going to use the right terminology here but it basically dives into the soil and breaks bonds and when those bonds are broken chemically broken it creates air in the soil or space in the soil and then you have humic acid that drives carbon right behind it and fills up space and that's that's what you do that's not going to affect any true green application in fact i was even texting with john perry about that he was like, nah, it's all good, man. That stuff would only make a True Green program work better because that's what those products do is they optimize whatever else is going down. And in Kate, True Green's case, it's going to be like an 1801 type fertilizer every single time, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's some type of um, content for those of you that I'm calling aspirers. And I don't know if that was the right way to start the podcast off, but I know there's a lot of you that are there that that's what you're doing. Either you, again, you're gonna have a lawn one day or you have one now and you wanna tiptoe into it or you just wanna be a more educated customer. I want you to know you're welcome here too. And I know that eventually as we keep going through this as I don't just teach lawn care as I preach lawn care, I know eventually that you're gonna stop trying to you know fix the floors, the bathroom floors in that apartment and you're gonna have your own house and you're gonna get out and you're gonna spray on your own and you're gonna take control of it. I know you'll get there eventually. So another thing I did want to talk about, this question came in a lot this week is again, some of y'all are starting to see your lawns, cool season lawns. You're starting to see them for the first time and you're seeing all these strange little trails that seem to be running all over the yard or in spots or in areas they might be. A lot of times you'll find them around air conditioning units or if you have a uh, a, a deck, you'll find them there. And what that is, is that's field mice or voles typically. And they've been scurrying through the lawn and chewing up things and doing that all during winter. And so those typically are not going to be long lasting type damage. What you want to do, Ryan Knorr actually made a really good video, even just today of showing you some of this damage in his lawn. If you go to Ryan Knorr's channel, K-N-O-R-R, -R, just search Ryan Knorr Lawn Care. And you just rake these areas out and he'll, he gets down and shows you, you can see the, a lot of the root structure is still there. The crowns are damaged in a lot of cases, but they're still there. And if you have even a small piece of that crown, you know, that's still alive and you have some root structure, a lot of that grass will regrow. Plus, if you have Kentucky bluegrass, which does have some rhizomous creeping ability, just fertilize like normal. It should fatten itself back up in there. Even my turf type tall fescue when I lived up in Indiana, which, you know, is not a rhizomus. It just gets fat. It doesn't have any type of rhizomes that spin out. But even when I would get field mouse damage, good shot of Milo early in the spring, bing, bang, boom, by, you know, by Kentucky Derby Day, it was back. You never knew there was a problem. So not something to worry about, but something you'll see and definitely something you want to rake out a little bit and just go look at, take and understand it, put it in your lawn journal and understand what it was. And then one of the things you can do, and I saw a couple guys in the Facebook group talking about this and I did it in probably not the best way, but you can take those green baits that you can get and uh, decon, I think they are, they're, they're mouse baits, they're green. You'll, you know what I'm talking about. If you've seen them, they're like bars. And you can put those in, you can get a little plastic bait station and put those in there and mark down where you see the mice, these field mice or vole damage this year, mark that down like in your lawn journal. And then next year, just before winter, like I would do it when I was about to winterize my pool every year in the fall, that's when I would go ahead and put out my mouse baits in those areas. And what that'll do is that'll cut back on the vole problem. It really will. I did notice that working. And so that's something you might want to try. The, where I noticed it working was in, yes, less damage the next year, but also in the spring, I would find the vole nests in the lawn. The thicker your lawn is, you'll find they'll nest right in the middle of your lawn. And when you pull them up, you'll find all the little vole babies, little field mouse. They're like little pink. They look like little tiny little pink pigs. Anyway, I have a video with that on my channel somewhere, but you'll, I found less of those the following spring. So something to think about. 
but those uh, that might also help cut down on it. But either way, it's not something that you need to go out and do seeding for. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could, but again, no pre-emergent in those areas. Just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what can be done there. I've got a question here next from New York. Quick question, if you have time, I am in Baldwinsville, New York, a Syracuse suburb. This is from Joe C. I have checked Greencast, and it says the average date for 55 degrees in the soil is early May. I am usually enjoying the mow a few weeks before that. What temp does the lawn come out of dormancy and start growing? I would assume the ground has to be somewhat warm. I plan on purchasing a soil thermometer to check for myself, but I'm going on vacation in mid-April and don't want to miss the application timing if I wait till May. Thanks, my dude. (laughs) All right, Joe. So what Joe is basically saying is, hey, what's going on? Because you're telling me that first application of pre-emergent, which we use per diamine, 0.38%, it's a granular product, and it's similar to all the others that you get with that same concentration. And what he's saying is, yes, Alan, you're telling me the first application goes down at 55 degrees. And yes, but actually, I start mowing, he says, a few weeks before that. So when does the grass actually start growing? Like, are they the same? And the answer is, Joe, yeah, they are the same. And this illustrates the talk about temperature zones or areas of the lawn. Because when you do start mowing, you're right, you're going to start mowing a little bit before the green cast tool shows you being at 55, because that's an average for an area. But in your lawn, you have hot zones. If you, if you remember back to every spring, the first mowing you do, there's very little green there. The second mowing you do, some areas will be green. It's not like the whole lawn just goes and busts up green all at the same time. Now, once your temperature is really sore, then it kind of will. But if you really pay attention to it, it greens up slowly in zones over time. And that's really how crabgrass works too. It doesn't all germinate on the very day that the Greencast tool says it's 55, and I know you know that, but it's it's a target. It's a zone. It's a window. It's, it's just an idea. It's a faint idea <laughs> that you're going for, but then you use your own logic and your own knowledge of your own lawn to adjust that up or back, because remember, we're doing two applications, and essentially... Six pounds per thousand in the spring. Three pounds now, three pounds later when we are approaching 70. So that's six pounds per thousand. And that should give you six months of control. What we're doing though, instead of doing one app like that, we're doing two, we call that a split app, because that's like two coats of paint rather than one coat of paint. The second coat can come through and cover any blemishes or areas that the first coat may have missed or faded on. But it's the same coverage. It's still gonna give you six months in there. Okay, so what you can do is you can move one sooner and you can move one later or however you want to do it to make it work for your area. So if you're going to go out of town, if you typically are going to hit sometime, as he says here in May, it's okay to apply in the second week of April or even the 10th of April. You're you're just moving it forward a couple of weeks. And that's probably a good idea based on what you're saying is that usually you have to mow a little sooner than what the Greencast tool is saying you. And I'm telling you that your lawn will wake up at the same time that crabgrass starts to germinate. It just means your particular lawn where you live happens to not line up 100% perfectly with the Greencast tool, but you have your own knowledge of your own land. You've learned your land and you know that you're going to be a little bit earlier than that. So I would go ahead and say, yep, throw that prodiamine down right about the same time that you're ready to start mowing. That's also gonna be typically when the forsythia bloom as well. Next, let's move down to St. Cloud, Florida. That's over not far from Orlando, so center of the state. This is a nutsedge question here. I was cutting my lawn this weekend and I noticed I have a few small spots of nutsedge. So I started looking at your videos on what to use and I see that you recently used an image product. Image is a brand name. But I've seen you recommend sedge hammer in the past. So my question is, which should I really use in this case? Like I said, it's a very small area. And other than that, all I've seen is a few small spots at the edge of my lawn where it meets my neighbor's lawn. So here's what Manny's got. He's got, it's gonna be Kalinga. I was just over at Real Low Dad's place. Well, it's not his place. It's his parents' place there in Orlando. Lakeland actually is where they're at. And we did a collab. If you wanna check him out, Real Low Dad, R-E-E-L, Real Low Dad. We did a collab. He did some St. Augustine sodding over there. We had a good time. It was fun to hang out a little bit. And in the front lawn of that house, they also have a really bad green Kalinga problem. I also have a bad Kalinga problem in my lawn. It seems to be really bad in a lot of Florida. It's very wet here. And Kalinga with those nutlets will like that when it gets wet. So Manny's got a very similar problem to what we all do. And so you have a couple choices here. The first thing is 
and looking at his exact situation as he's telling me it's only in a couple spots. So that's going to really change the strategy. If he told me it was everywhere, like at the real low dad property we were at in the front lawn where the whole lawn, I would say the lawn, it had the Kalinga everywhere. But if you looked at it as a percentage, there was Bermuda there, St. Augustine, and then the third, you know, largest type of invasive whatever in that grass was the Kalinga. It was like, so it was like a 30% Kalinga lawn, I would say. 30% Kalinga lawn? Sounds like a t-shirt. Manny's only got, he doesn't have that. Manny's got much less. He's only got spots. So that's going to change the strategy right off. And what I would say is you're going to want to get Manny, you're going to want to get Image Kills Nuts Edge. It's a green and white label. It's called Image Kills Nuts Edge. It's not the same product I've been using in my videos, which has a purple and white label. This is Image Kills Nuts Edge. Now Manny's got St. Augustine grass here. And that product comes in a liquid concentrate, or it also comes in a ready-to-spray. And what ready-to-spray is, is the hose-in sprayer. That ready-to-spray, I think it covers like 8,000 square feet. That's not a spot spray type product, but if you had certain zones, you might be able to use that. But what I actually recommend for you, Manny, is to get that Image Kills Nuts Edge. And this is what I do like this product for, is it comes in a liquid concentrate. I think, and, and again, you need to read the label on what you have, but I believe the label on that product is like two and a half to four ounces per gallon and for a spot spray and they want you to spot spray weeds until wet. I believe that's what it is. Again, read the label. But on there is also a rate for a trigger sprayer, a you know, a hand sprayer. They actually have that on that label for what they're a trigger sprayer. So you can just do a little math and they give it to you in ounces. They give you the, the math to really dial it in. If you only have a couple spots, you could fill up a 32 ounce sprayer or a 16 ounce sprayer, I mean and just mix that tiny, tiny amount with that liquid concentrate and then go out and psh, psh, spot spray just the areas where you're seeing the small amount of Kalinga. And you'll be good, You can. that's it, you don't have to do any more. Now if it starts to spread, then you might wanna zone spray with some Pinnet Magnum pre-emergent next year, or, or during the year, because Kalinga kinda comes up all year in Florida. Um, and you would, you would do that and you could mix that in small, that's a super low use product, it's like 28 milliliters to the gallon for a year, I believe. So that's a small use product. You have to buy a whole gallon of it up front, but either way, I don't want to get too down the road with that, but if you did notice the problem getting away from you, that would be one thing you could do as a small zoned pre-emergent strategy as well, especially if it's creeping in from your neighbors. Okay, our next one comes from Chris, and Chris is in Michigan. This is going to be a question that is around pre-emergence again, but pre-emergence that contain fertilizer, because this is one that I don't talk about a lot. I don't mention this a lot, so I believe this is a good one for us to go down. Chris says, longtime listener, first time caller, quick question. I emailed my local landscape and feed store about what pre-emergence they carry, and they hit me back with the following. 1903, so that's the analysis, NPK, 1903.125% dimension, and then 1803.15% dimension. So basically, He's getting a Dimension product. So Dimension is here. That is a pre-emergent product. We talk mostly about Prodiamine this year, which you will also find that as a brand name, Barricade. So Barricade is a brand name. The active ingredient of Barricade is Prodiamine. So if you're buying the generic, I'm using air quotes as I say that, you're buying Prodiamine, but it's the same thing essentially, as long as the concentration of active ingredient is the same. And on the flip side, you have Dimension, which is a brand name for here. Again, same deal. So he has available to him a Dithiapir product. I'm not going to go into the concentrations of it. We're talking more about the fact that they've got these fertilizer additives in it. But here's let's finish with the question. So again, he's sitting on a 1903 Dithiapir product. It's fertilizer and pre-emergent in the bag on the prills. And as you apply, you're getting nitrogen. You're getting a little bit of potassium because it's a 1903. And you're also applying your pre-emergent. That's the type of product it is. You could essentially call this a weed and feed in a way, but it's really a pre-emergent and feed. That's how you would look at it. I'm just trying to say that in a way to illustrate the picture for you so you understand. This is pre-emergent and fur in the bag. He asks, is it preferred that prodiamine be applied in the spring and dithiapir in the fall, or can either one be used? It seemed like the guide was really pointing towards prodiamine, so I wanted to make sure I understood because there's a large gap. So the answer is, in short, for a DIYer, we're using granulated products here, granular products. There is not going to be a difference in the prodiamine or in the dithiapir. They're going to work the same. Same mode of action, they're gonna get you the same results. 
I do believe from my experience that prodiamine will stick in the soil a little better. So if you're a rainy period in the spring and you have a choice, go with prodiamine. But if you have the dithiop here that you're going to get locally, which I recommend you get pre-emergence locally if you can, it'll be much cheaper for you. And I'm telling you, every Home Depot and Lowe's across the state all of you across the United States is going to start carrying prodiamine only products next year. You watch. I've already seen that what they're doing with malorganite clones. They're going to start listening to what goes on in this community and they're going to start carrying prodiamine only products. But until they do, if you have to get something locally, you should. So the answer is in short, they're the same thing. Do it. Dithiapyr, I do believe, gives you a little bit more flexibility in the calendar year maximums. So I don't still don't think there should be a need for any DIYer to go that high anyway, but that is one of the advantages to dithiapyr. Check the label again on the products that you have. Now, the next question is, what's the thought on putting down the product with the extra nitrogen in it, as well as shown in the product they they quoted me here? Just will that kickstart the lawn? So that's gonna be, so let me, ha let me explain my thoughts on these products that are fertilizer and pre-emergent. They work fine, but they give you less flexibility. And here's what I mean by that. I like to take my prodiamine, my pre-emergent, or in this case, dimension, and I like to do split apps in the spring. And I know I'm re repeating this, but I just want you to understand, I like to do split apps in the spring because I believe two coats of paint is better than one heavy coat of paint. Doing one heavy coat is the same as two split apps or two split coats. It's the same thing if they're done right, but you have weather factors that can come in there. You have foot traffic that can come in there. You have... Who knows what kind of things can come in there. And so if you do the second application as a backup to the first, it just is like a bit of redundancy. Now, here's the challenge. When you have fertilizer included in that, you have to take that into account at what other applications are you making? Because the smaller amounts with these fertilizer products are not going to be enough to be all of the fertilizer you need. You will staff if you're using my strategy, which my strategy is that low split app. You're going to have to still supplement with other fertilizers. So it's just another math equation to add in. You have to account for the nitrogen that's in that dimension product in this case, as well as for whatever you're using. If you're using, you know, Malorganite or Scots or whatever you're using. You have to account for that. So that's why I typically don't like that. The other thing is, you know, you might have an opportunity where you really do want to go with organic fertilizer because organic fertilizer is going to stimulate microbes and organic fertilizer is going to also um, add carbon to the soil. These are positive things. So if you have to back down on the organics in order to accommodate this synthetic fertilizer here, again, maybe not the same amount of benefit that you're gonna be getting in the long run. So that's why I don't like it. Now, here's the deal though, bro. These bags that he was getting here, I don't know the poundage on them, but they're like 18 bucks. I mean, to have our stuff delivered to you is $55 because of the shipping. It's a 55, 55 pound bag. So I can't help it. That's just how it works. That's just how it goes. This is why I told you Home Depot is gonna start carrying this stuff. I already know. But what I'm getting at is if you can get this so much cheaper I mean, dude, save the money and do the extra math. That's what I'm getting at. Now, this next one is coming in by voice. We actually opened up a call-in line. For those of you that don't know, I started um, having Ben the Lawn Guardian work with me. He is doing a lot of uh, extra work on the side for me to help keep me organized in some of these things because we have so many different content um, way, ways we're putting out content. So I've got him coming on part-time here working with me to help me keep that organized, to help me understand what the heartbeat of the community is so I can really hone in and bring the content that's needed. So he helps me with that. And one of the things that he did was set up this call in line for me, and he's going to be managing that and taking some of our most frequently asked questions, and we're going to put them on the air. So we did announce that. If you want to call in and, and answer or ask a question, you have to press zero after you hear the message, and then you can leave a message. And the number is 833-526-8477. That's a toll-free number, 833-526-8477. Let me do that in a radio voice. Ready? <laughs> Call 833-526-8477. That's right here on the blower on the morning zoo. <laughs> All right. So if you want to call in and you want to get your voice on the podcast, it's possible. I don't know how many calls we're going to get. We didn't get too many. We just announced it on Twitter and like in the Facebook group and a few people called in. And that's one of the ones we have here. Hey, Alan, it's Charles from Woodstock, Illinois. I have Kentucky bluegrass, pretty little ryegrass, and there's probably some turf type tall fescue in there too. My question is my backyard 
is drowning in water whenever it rains. I have three large dogs, anywhere from 55 to 90 pounds each. And I have tons of shade thanks to two large maple trees. How do I turn it from a mud pit into some grass that can survive the torture of the dogs? Thanks, Alan. You're the best. See you later. All right. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for being our first call. And I, I hope you guys like that. I think that's pretty cool. Actually, it reminds me of, like, again, old school radio. I love that stuff. So, Charles, let's go through it. First of all, my friend, this is a tough challenge. We have standing water during heavy periods of rain, I guess, or just heavy periods of maybe melted snow. So standing water, giant dogs, three dogs, and big trees. All of those are natural enemies to the lawn. So let's just think about something. Let's go down a little bit of a road here. I want to tell you that as a general rule, turf grass is a full sun plant. Like if you go to the store, like if you go to Home Depot, right, and you start buying plants, they'll have different sections of the Home Depot garden center and some will be covered with some fabric. Some will be even more inside. Some will be outside and some will be fully outside. And of course, you know, you can go where you're buying plants, especially house plants. They'll say this is a full sun plant. This is a partial sun plant. And the same thing works with grass. So if you were to go through and look at turf grass, 99% of turf grass is going to be a full sun plant. Now I know we have shade tolerant grass and that's the key word there is tolerant. And in cool season lawns, it's very true that shade tolerant grass, like the fine fescues, like the creeping red fescue or whatever other fine fescues are out there, chewing's fescue, those definitely don't like direct full sun. But down here in the South, when we talk about shade tolerant turf grass, we're gonna talk more about, because there is no shade tolerant turf grass, I'm just gonna tell you, in the warm season, but there are certain varieties that are more shade tolerant than others. For example, if you ask me about St. Augustine grass, what is a better shade tolerant St. Augustine grass? I'm going to say palmetto or bitter blue and definitely not Floratam because they will do better. But the misconception is that it will do great in shade and it won't do great in shade. It's just going to do better than bad. The other thing is, is about a misconception, we're just going to stay here for a second, about palmetto because everybody has hammered in in the marketing that palmetto is a shade-tolerant St. Augustine grass. Just so you guys know, palmetto is an excellent full sun grass. It's what I have right out here as my main stage. It is my very favorite St. Augustine grass variety is palmetto. I love the color of it. I love the soft feel of it. It's so much softer. I love the fact that you can mow it lower. I've been mowing it at three and a half inches, which is very low for that for St. Augustine grass. And it grows wonderfully in full sun. And in fact, if you go to a sod farm, there is no shade at a sod farm. All of the grass at the sod farm is growing in full sun. So never forget that. So that's a misconception we get with the warm season turf. But let's go all the way back up to the north and let's talk about your shade tolerant ones. Definitely, they need to be in an area where they're not getting blasted by the sun, mainly because the grass blades are so much finer and they can dry out quicker. However, let's go away from that right now and after realizing that grass, as a general rule, is a full sun plant, the next thing you have to understand is there is absolutely no grass that will grow in dense shade, period. There is grass that will grow in partial shade or dappled sun, we can call it, but you even have to think about how that is because shade comes from a lot more than trees. Trees obviously shade out your grass, but there are also the leaves that the trees drop. And trees are always dropping leaves. Down here in the south, they, oak trees drop leaves pretty much all year round. But even up north, trees are always dropping leaves and other things. And those leaves can cover the grass, even if they're not thick, even if it's a partial covering of leaves. Wherever those leaves are blocking sunlight, that is going to weaken the grass. So that's one thing. The other thing is there's tree roots. From the trees, there are the roots that are in the soil. Those compete for, number one, just space in the soil. You know, you have these little grass roots and these giant tree roots and a lot of small tree roots. That's a competition. They're also for competing not only for space, but for water and nutrients in the soil. So those are other things. The tree is going to win. It's just bigger. It's a bigger bully. It's a natural enemy of the grass. 
The other thing to think about that some of us don't is your house also blocks the sun, unless you have a giant yard, but at some point your house is going to block a portion of your lawn from the sun, and it it completely blots out the sun because it's your house. Think about that. Your shed will also block areas of the sun. So if you have not only the large trees, but then at the second part of the day, these houses blocking, now you have a double whammy. And these things can start to add up. Not only does your house and your shed block the sun, but like your kid's play set blocks the sun. A lot of them have wooden planks and things you're running over, giant pirate flags. All of those things are going to block sunlight. On top of that, around those areas, there's foot traffic, right? From you, from the kids. It's a back lawn in this case. So it's an area that you use. You're walking back and forth to your shed. You're walking around to do whatever you do in the backyard, to your grill or to your fire pit. There's all kind of things that go on in that yard, not only just the trees and not only just the dog. Now, before I give Charles the advice that I want to give, because it sounds all doom and gloom here, I want to just say one other thing. And if, let's eliminate the fact that you have giant dogs, because that's a different thing here. And let's just say that you're somebody like a lot of my customers used to be on the south side of Chicago. There's some very beautiful old neighborhoods in the, on the south side of Chicago with large mature trees lining the streets. And because of that, you don't get a lot of sun in the parkways. Now, the houses sit back far enough that they get sun. There's tiny little lawns anyway. We call them postage stamps. But the parkways right out by the street would get almost no sun. And then on top of that, because it's the city, people park in the street and they're always walking on the parkways. So they're always walking on that grass. So it's really tough to grow grass in those parkways. And I know that a lot of you deal with that even outside of city or urban environments. A lot of you deal with something similar where your tree-lined streets are beautiful, but your parkway won't grow grass because you're not getting enough sunlight in there. So there's nothing wrong with being like some of my customers were who just realized that every single spring and every single fall, they were gonna seed their parkway. They would get whatever kind of, I'm using air quotes, dense shade grass seed they could find or shady grass seed or whatever they found, the cheap stuff, because it, it, nothing's gonna survive there for long, so they didn't necessarily care, and they would seed in a lawn, and it would grow, and they would keep it wet, and it would be there, and they'd people water a lot <laughs> sometimes, but they would keep that going, and then summer would come, and foot traffic would hit it, and people would come over, and yeah, it would get all stamped down and kind of brown and crushed in the in the the during the summer, but then the fall would come and they would go right back out and seed again and they'd have it pretty. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, we can take that a step further. Let's say you have a shady backyard. You realize that in the springtime, there's no leaves on the trees and as the days get longer, they're overcast typically in the spring, so we got that not going for us, but we don't have leaves on the trees, so sometimes your lawn will kind of leaf itself out in the early spring and then it'll fade into the summer as the trees leaf out and block the sun. So if you think about it, you could have a lawn like that that you're managing, again, minus the dogs, but you're managing that with a lot of grass seed. That's just what you're doing. You just realize that the situation you're in calls for grass seed a lot during the spring. Seed is cheap, throw her down. Maybe you cut down on the fur and, and you spread seed every month, right? Just to keep something going because the good news about a shaded area is that typically crabgrass will not grow in a shaded area because it's also a full sun plant. The difference with crabgrass is it lives hard for one year and dies. It's not like your Kentucky bluegrass that wants to stay around year over year. It's a perennial, so it's gonna try to save up energy as much as it can, which is why it needs that sunlight. But crabgrass lives hard, fast, drops seeds, and dies. So it definitely can't survive in shade at all because it has nothing stored up. It doesn't have time to store up. It's only got enough time to grow and reproduce. It's kind of interesting. So nothing wrong with having a lawn that you just constantly seed knowing that that is your chore and that is your challenge. So for Charles, here's what I would tell you, bud. The first thing is, the way it is right now, this is a mostly unwinnable situation. You've got too many things stacked up against your lawn. Giant trees, giant dogs, standing water. And then you throw in one or two of those other variables that I mentioned or some I didn't mention, and it's, and it's unwinnable. But I think that the best advice, no matter what, would be if you have areas of standing water is to take care of that first. Whether you ever grow a lawn back there or not, you don't want standing water in the backyard because of the dogs in the mud. So I would look at installing some surface drains. Maybe you need fringe drains. Maybe you have downspouts that you need to route away. I did a couple of videos on that. I will tell you that I don't ever want to have to dig any kind of drainage again in my lawn, but I'm glad that I did and I'm glad that I gutted it out and it was worth it. And it is a very easy job to do when it comes to technical prowess. It's just digging trenches and making sure that there's some fall. That's really all it is. So doing the work is not technically difficult, but physically it is extremely difficult, at least it was for me. So that could be something that you get into and that you try 
definitely get that water out of there. Secondly, I think what I would try to do, depending how big the backyard is, is I would create a dog run, maybe somewhere where, I, I th I'm assuming you have a shed, because you're in Woodstock, Illinois, everybody in Woodstock has a shed in their backyard, and it's usually going to be out towards the back, I'm just making this up as I go, but you'll get the idea, maybe the way that you have to walk to the shed, where your foot traffic goes, maybe somehow you could include that as a dog run, turn that into something else, some rubber mulch, or some rocks, or whatever's going to be comfortable for the pups, maybe even some dare I say, some fake turf, some synthetic turf, but whatever you can do in that dog run, let the let the pups run over there, you walk over there, keep your lawn tools over there, all that, maybe you use that to wash off your mower, or whatever, it's just your area over there, and you keep the dogs out of the rest of the lawn. And then you'll have to add time for you to take the dogs to the park a lot more and let them you know, run and, and run out their energy over there. That would be another commitment that you'd have to make, but again, that's that give and take you know, with these types of situations and, and the way you can think them out. And then the last thing you can do with the large maples, I mean, if they're silver maples, that's not my favorite kind of tree anyway. I'm not the guy to tell you to cut trees down and I don't want you to get in trouble with your neighbors. Mr. T used to live out there somewhere and he got in trouble one time for cutting down all his trees. But I want to say maybe you can have them majorly thinned out. I don't know. But anything you can do to allow those trees to throw some sunlight through is going to be a positive, especially if you're eliminating two of the other variables that are also causing you issues. And then from there, maybe you do try some of those fescues that can do a little bit better in shade and you work on some seeding and maybe you take on a little of that strategy of constant seeding. So I hope that was helpful to you. I know we kind of went down it a little bit of a different way, but I hope that helps you think helps you strategize because some things are not just solved with, hey, I'm gonna find a grass seed for this problem. Sometimes it's more about looking at the different factors involved and seeing what you can eliminate so that way you can give the grass the best chance to grow no matter what it's labeled for. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is this weekend, if you live in Wisconsin, I've been invited by my friends at Malorganite to speak at the Realtors Home and Garden Show. That's Saturday, March 23rd and 24th, 6 p.m. on the 23rd and 12.30 p.m. on Sunday the 24th. I will be speaking about DIY lawn strategies you can start tomorrow. So make sure you come by if you're gonna be at the Realtors Home and Garden Show there. That is in West Allis, Wisconsin at the Expo Center there. And then if you can't make one of those dates or you want to come by, we're also having a meet and greet. That's Saturday night, March 23rd at 8 p.m. That's also going to be sponsored by Malorganite. And that's going to be at the Hampton Inn & Suites, 8201 West Greenfield Avenue in West Allis, Wisconsin. That's the Hampton Inn & Suites. So come by for the meet and greet. We'll be there for a couple hours. We'll be giving away some swag, drinking a couple two tree beers and talking lawn care. So with that, I really want to thank you all for tuning into the podcast this week. I hope that this has been helpful to you and I will see you in the lawn.